This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I am Gilad Halpern. And I am Dalia Shenlin. I'm your new co-host together with Gilad, and we'll be talking every week about literature and research that has affected all of our lives. Our guest today is Professor Itamar Rabinovich, who has just published a new biography, Yitzhak Rabin, Soldier, Leader, Statesman, by Yale University Press. Professor Rabin Rabinovich is president of the Israel Institute in Washington, D.C. and Tel Aviv. He was the president of Tel Aviv University and served as Yitzhak Rabin's ambassador to the U.S. and chief negotiator with Syria. Professor Rabinovich, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. So let me ask you this by way of introduction. A lot has been written about uh, Rabin, especially in the wake of his assassination a bit more than 20 years ago. When you uh, took on this project, what were you trying to achieve? What new light were you seeking to shed on, on his personality? When I started it, I did not know the extent of the new light that uh, I would be shedding because I was also researching. It was a, a challenging and intriguing task because uh, he was a man I knew very well. I worked with uh, very closely, even intimately. But I didn't know as much about his uh, childhood, background, the family, earlier phases of his uh, career. So it was a journey, a journey of, of discovery. And there were certain things I, I knew uh, very well when I started the journey, and I was uh, determined to share with the, with the reader, mostly about uh, the latter period of, of his life, his second tenure as prime minister, the one uh, in which I, I worked uh, with him, and about which I obviously knew a lot. Mm -hmm. Everyone who hears about this uh, project now book has two, mainly two questions. One is, why did Rabin go to Oslo? Uh, the second is, what difference did uh, Yigal Amir make when he assassinated Yitzhak Rabin? So I set out to answer these two questions, but many others as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I mean, you know, there is always this question of, did Yigal Amir also kill the peace process in Oslo? But I think you refer to it in a bigger way. You talk about a sort of culture war in Israeli society, and I want to understand from you, what is that culture war that you refer to that Rabin, you know, represented one side of, and where does it stand today? I mean, did Yigal Amir not only change the peace process, but something more fundamental about the direction of Israeli society? He did. Actually, I, I don't look just at the assassination. I look at the period that preceded the assassination incitement, and then I look at what I call one unit from uh, the assassination of November 4 to Netanyahu's victory over Shimon Peres in the elections of the spring of 1996, six months. I'm arguing that Netanyahu's election and the direction Israeli politics and policies took after that was not inevitable. That Peres, for instance, had ample uh, prospects of winning the elections, had made other choices that it was a mistake not to call for an immediate election, that it was a mistake not to prosecute the people who engaged in the incitement, and therefore the outcome, which was a victory of Netanyahu, not a, a death of the peace process, but a, a severe blow to the peace process. There was, there was the, I would say, the dynamism of the peace process during the Rabin years was, was arrested, was stopped, it was revived. There were several serious attempts to come to a deal either with Syria or with the Palestinians or with both under Barak, under, per, uh, uh, under uh, Olmert. Olmert. Sharon did not uh, quite seek a peace process, but he, uh, he made s significant choices in trying to reshape Israeli-Palestinian relations. So you cannot say that Amir killed the peace process. He, he dealt it a severe blow. In my view, the, the more severe blow that he dealt was to um, Israeli society and politics. And if you look at the Israeli politics today, if you look at the makeup of the Israeli coalition and, and government, actually people who were identified not, not with the assassination but with the incitement, with the broad, larger policy that, uh, say, Amir's environment uh, stood for, they are uh, part of the coalition and not just a part of the coalition. They dictate policies. When I watched Netanyahu uh, the other day uh, in the 
press conference with uh, Trump, performing gymnastics uh, just not to utter the, the words uh, two states that he did had used previously at the Bar-Ilan speech, I realized, as did everybody else, that he was actually bowing to the pressures of Naftali Bennett. Mm-hmm. But I, I understand what you're saying about the culture war in Israel and about Israeli society, but is this really the case also about Israeli politics? Because Rabin was assassinated a bit less than a year before the end of his term. He was up for, was going to be up for re-election. His popularity just before his assassination was in a free fall. Don't you think that in October 1996, when he would have gone to election, he would have lost to Netanyahu and Israeli politics would have been in exactly the same course? Yeah. Well, you say in the books that he very well might have won, but maybe you'll explain have, why you think. Have. Yes. Yeah, well, we are now engaging in uh, what is known as counterfactual history. Yeah. So uh, uh, what if, uh, the famous what if, we don't know, obviously. Obviously. I... I I think that at the end of the day, coming to to the elections, Rabin Rabin would have won. But that you know, that's my uh, that's my speculation. Speaking of the culture war, yes, Rabin was the epitome of of the old uh, of the old elite in Israel, labor movement, Palmach, IDF, North Tel Aviv, and Yigal Amir represented the other pole. You know, uh, of Yemenite destruction, say very low middle class neighborhood in Arzalia. Uh, Bar-Ilan University, uh, settlers, uh, and uh, Orthodox. Uh, um, and there was, during the what, what I call the incitement period, since between Oslo and the assassination, and particularly during the ugly month of the summer of 1995, this country was uh, split by that uh, political conflict and culture war. And uh, Rabin's assassination was a, a severe blow to the old elites and to the old order in this country. But was it really just the old elites and the old order? Because you also talk about the period before the assassination as representing a sort of golden age, before the incitement. What did you mean by that? And where has that gone today? A golden age or an apparent golden age? Apparent. I think the people wanted to believe that the, the peace process as led by Rabin would lead to a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. I'm not sure that this would have happened. Rabin was uh, himself was a very realistic, careful person, and he did not he did not envision uh, an end to the Arab-Israeli conflict. But uh, he definitely wanted to embark on a path of uh, peacemaking. He wanted to consolidate Israel's uh, existence in its immediate environment because he thought the real threats to Israeli national security came not from our neighbors but from. Uh, the powerful states to the east, uh, Iran and uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, Iraq itself has in the meantime disintegrated, but at the time represented a, a, still represented a formidable uh, threat. Uh, so he called it changing uh, Israel's order of priorities. And, and there was a euphoria in the air. The uh, uh, Oslo, the prospect of a, a, a deal with Syria, the economic conferences of, of the Middle East, uh, three of them, uh, Israeli flag uh, hoisted in North Africa and in, in, in the Gulf, and the repercussions in the, in the larger world. People thought that this was the time to visit Israel, to invest in Israel. Israel was doing very well in, internationally. So that sense of, of euphoria uh, is what one would call the apparent golden age. It, it was uh, brief and to some extent illusory. What a contrast, though, to where we are now, where everybody is pretty much convinced that the world hates Israel. It's a totally different environment. Except Netanyahu. He says that he's managed to uh, set up all sorts of alliances with other... Yes, uh, but at the same time, <laughs> assuming that the global yeah. media is against yeah, unfortunately, us... Against unfortunately, yeah. shortly after, after saying that... We had the Security Council uh, resolution and a few other uh, a few other setbacks. So uh, that's uh, I think unfortunately uh, for unfor- Netanyahu. Yeah, yes. and and you know, and also the it's not just us. I think uh, there is a general sense in the world, looking at American politics and European politics, that this is not a good time for the world. Yeah. 
I, I want to go back a bit to uh, rewind to the earlier years that you, you cover in the book. You describe Rabin, as others uh, have, as a modest, shy, low-key, level-headed sort of personality as well as, as leader. Now, intuitively, I would say that these qualities would prevent someone from reaching a high office rather than get him there. How, how do you think he made it? Well, I, uh, I actually started the book with a quote from Henry Kissinger who uh, knew Rabin very well, was to some extent his mentor when Rabin came as ambassador to, uh, to Washington. And he commented that uh, Rabin was a, a very unlikely diplomat. He hated small talk. He hated the, uh, the atmosphere of Washington cocktail parties uh, and other elements that uh, go along with, let's say, the popular perception of what diplomacy is. And he says, yet he was a great a uh, great ambassador, and so forth and so forth. And what I say is that once I quote Kissinger, he said that these, uh, these qualities that uh, made him an, uh, an unlikely diplomat also made him an unlikely politician. He didn't like to, quote-unquote, press the flesh, uh, idle talk. He, he, wouldn't, he didn't like particularly visiting party branches, uh, party me- center, uh, or center uh, members, Uh, on the shoulder, going to weddings, uh, phoning people for an idle chat, things that politicians have to do in order to uh, to reach the top and, and survive. And this unlikely politician became a statesman. That's th- phase three. And what I'm arguing is that those po- qualities or some of the qualities that you cited before and made him a, an unlikely and in the beginning an unsuccessful politician helped made him A statesman, because a statesman, unlike a politician, uh, is examined by the ability to have a vision and to have the, uh, the courage to uh, translate vision uh, into decision and action. W- would he have lasted five minutes in politics today, do you think? In the era of Trumpism, triumphalism, yeah, because there are where so everything many is about bluster and personality and No, the personality, the personality was there, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, you know, over the years, he also... mastered some of the qualities of, of a politician. He, became a, he was a better politician mm-hmm. in the second term than he was in, in the first term. And secondly, uh, I think that quality still, uh, still holds. I look at Angela Merkel in, in Germany. I look at a, a politician like McCain uh, in the United States, a, a very significant senator who stands up to, to Trump. And, you know, you remember that John McCain was the captive in, in Vietnam uh, who decided not to take an early release because his father was an admiral and stayed another five years in Vietnamese uh, or Viet Cong uh, captivity. So these qualities still have uh, still have value. And I'd like to believe that uh, Trumpism and, and similar phenomena will, will eventually fade or fade away. Right. Although look where John McCain is now and look where Trump is. But let's leave that aside. That's right. American politics. I want to ask you a question also on this personal level. You know, I think I heard somewhere, sometime, I can't quote it, that the figure of Ari Ben Kanaan in the book Exodus, the famous, you know, mythological yeah. book about the story of Israel, was somehow modeled on the young Rabin. No. No, you don't think it's Yossi true? Arel. No, that, oh, that, Yossi I know. It was mm. Yossi, Yossi Arel, the commander of Exodus. Uh, who actually looked like Paul Newman. <laughs> Good for him. And, yeah. <laughs> And uh, was a very charismatic, attractive figure. Uh-huh. So Ari Ben-Knan was modeled on, on Yossi Ari, okay. the late Yossi Ari. Okay, but, but my, my, question, from the same my question yeah. is still the same. My yeah. question is, have we, you know, there's these mythological figures in, his, in the Israeli sort of persona and self-perception and, uh, and external perception as well, the people who are the heroes of the country. And what you've talked about is some of the way Rabin's legacy has been remembered in his mythological status as the peacemaker, the dovish, you know, the, 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 the left wing, something or other. And then you critique that at the end of the book and say, well, actually, he was really, first of all, a security person, a military person. And this was his pragmatic decision. Can you talk about the gap between who he was as a mythological figure and who he really was, which is part of what you're talking, you're yeah. writing a book about who he really was? Yeah, to begin with, you know, he was uh, the quintessential Sabra. Not he alone, he, Diane, alone, they, they all were quintessential Sabras. And there is a, a line by the, by the poet uh, Chernichovsky that a man is like uh, a piece of, his, uh, of, the, uh, of the landscape, the landscape uh, of his, of his uh, homeland's landscape. And uh, he was that. Now, y- young Israelis particularly are not familiar with that. And 
part, not of the English version of the book, but of the Hebrew version of the book that will come out in, in June, uh, is meant from uh, uh, my point of view to convey to young Israelis or to immigrants from the Soviet Union who were not familiar with all of that, the sense of 20, 30 years ago was still a common, a common knowledge. So that is one aspect of, of this. Rabin was not a charismatic leader. He didn't have natural charisma the way Alon of 48 had or the way uh, Moshe Dayan had in, uh, in later years. He had authority, he had credibility, he, he was attractive to the public for uh, other reasons, not because he was a galvanizing speaker or a, a, a man with uh, an effervescent uh, uh, personality, Qu quite to the contrary, in, in effect. Was he ambitious at all? I mean, if you compare him to his arch rival at the time, Shimon Peres, whom he described as an indefatigable schemer, we all knew that Shimon Peres had just one goal in mind, and that is to reach the the top of the of the ladder. Was Rabin? Did he knew where where he was going, or was it just you know one victory after the other, his, the great victory uh, in in forty eight that he was instrumental in, and the even greater victory in sixty seven that he presided over? Did the events just take, hoist him uh, upwards, or was it really down to him and his ambition? Yeah. No, he uh, Rabin himself, sort of needling uh, Shimon Peres, would say for me. Being prime minister is not, uh, he said, is, is an option. It's not an obsession. That was one of his ways of needling his rival, uh, Shimon Peres. I think it came gradually. When he became prime minister the first time in 1974, he was surprised when uh, the, the old guard of Mapai picked him up uh, to replace Golda Meir. Uh, Pinchas Sapir and Yossi Sarid were the two principal kingmakers at, uh, at the time. And it can only be understood against the back, backdrop of the debacle of 1973 and the fact that he had not been part of that and that he, he was the, the victorious uh, chief of staff of 67. And so he was, he, he was surprised. He didn't, I don't think he ever expected to be prime minister. He, he always looked at the next phase. Uh, when he was a lieutenant colonel, he wanted to be colonel. When he was a colonel, he wanted to be general. When he was a general, he definitely wanted to be chief of staff. And then he wanted to be to go into politics, looking at becoming a cabinet member. And he thought that uh, being ambassador in Washington would be a good preparation for the transition from military life to, to political Indeed life. And it was. And that, yeah, and, and it was. I describe it in, in the book. Several, he made several attempts to become a cabinet member. He was uh, disappointed several times, but uh, he came back. His relationship with Golda Meir was spoiled. He didn't treat him very well, made him a junior minister, and then he ended up replacing her. Now, once he became prime minister, obviously he wanted to be successful, and w since he failed and had to resign, he definitely wanted to redeem himself. And he was given a rare a privilege of, of a second chance 15 years later, um, and that was a very important Point how, how was crucial was his own self-redemption as defense minister in the 1980s? Would you say that it was really a turning point in his, uh, in his legacy, in, in his career? It was because this is how he built his position in the country. This is how he acquired the authority and the respect that he came to, uh, to enjoy in the public. He became Mr. National Security in a country uh, obsessed with uh, national, national security. And that was the... And that's that, what gave him the credentials to be to a be, peacemaker? First of all, to be re-elected as uh, prime minister, and and then from that uh, position of strength to be to become a a, a peacemaker. We know we know that uh, for an Israeli leader to uh, to be able to persuade the Israeli public to make concessions, uh, the leader needs to be perceived as strong on security. You know, one of the uh, paradoxes of Israeli life is that the right wing can make. Uh, peace more easily than the left wing, except they don't, they they don't, don't want to. They don't want to. But in many ways, this trajectory reminds me of uh, a certain protege of Rabin's who would very much like to see himself following the footsteps of having had one failed prime ministership term, having served after that as defense minister, and possibly setting himself up for a comeback as a second term of prime minister. Of course, I'm referring to Ehud Barak. Right. What do you think we learn from Rabin about where Barak is going? Do you think Barak is looking at Rabin's career saying, I could do this too? Uh, yeah, he definitely wants... Uh, he definitely wants it. He knows that uh, it, it was a brief uh, tenure. 
and uh, he wants to be back, but uh, he also, I think, genuinely feels that the country is in bad shape, that it needs direction and leadership, and that he can provide it. Uh, but uh, he has yet to redeem himself with the Israeli public. I just want, want to uh, um, ask you, you said that um, you worked under him, we all know that, you said that you knew him personally and intimately, but I'd like you to uh, tell us now about the first time uh, that you met him, what were the consequences, and what were your impressions after that meeting? The first time I met him, I was a lieutenant in uh, Israeli military intelligence, he was the chief of staff, and I was uh, ushered in to brief him on what was going on on the Syrian border. So in those days, a lieutenant could still go see the chief of staff. It was a, a smaller IDF and uh, much less uh, structured and, and formal. The second time was uh, in 1976. He convened uh, a meeting with a group of Middle East and, and, and Soviet experts to discuss the interim agreement with uh, Egypt a year, a year later. And we actually had an argument. And I, I thought that was the end of... Uh, of the relationship we didn't quite have. Do you remember he, what about? People never realize that arguing is actually usually very impressive to the other side because well, you've challenged actually, him. Well, yeah. actually, I think it. Uh, I think he appreciated the fact that this young academic uh, stood up to the prime minister. And then, then we began to meet socially. In, we met in at other people, and they invited us, and we used to invite them. I mean, Leah and 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 Rabin. Uh, you know, not uh, three, four times a year. Sort of. Uh, a casual social friendship, relationship, not deep. Also, since he was in opposition and before he became Minister of Defense, he and Shimon Peres, by the way, used to invite myself and, and other Middle East experts to be briefed. They didn't have intelligence briefings and they used us. So we had a, a relationship. And then uh, when he appointed me, that, that of course was a a very curious moment. Uh, in 1992, he, was, he became the prime minister. He invited me to, to his home for a meeting at noon. I, I, did, I didn't know what, what was the agenda. I, I thought it was either the Washington embassy or the Syrian negotiations. So um, he, he was not great on small talk, so directly to business. Uh, he said, the thing is most urgent to me is I need a new uh, head of the delegation for the peace talks with Syria. He said, can you recommend someone who has a public standing and know the subject matter? Well, I knew what he wanted, but it, it was a bit awkward. And he said, I'm recommending myself. So I said, well, I could think maybe of a couple of names. He said, I'm not interested in a couple of names. I'm interested in one name. He said, I'd be happy to do it. He said, oh, I'm so uh, I'm so happy. And <laughs> we went to work. And then he added, we'll talk about other things later, by which obviously meant the Washington embassy. And a few months later, he told me that he also wanted me to be his ambassador in, in Washington. And once we started working together, the, the mutual trust and uh, uh, I said the sense of uh, pleasure of working together set in rapidly and became a very close relationship. Let me ask you also about the developments from there, because Rabin, you know, at this point is, uh, well, the negotiations were fairly secret around Oslo. Were, who was surprised? Were you surprised or did you say, I sort of knew this was happening? Or even if you didn't know it was happening, maybe you could have projected that this is where things would go. How did you How did you find no, out about the Oslo Accords? I was uh, briefed by Shimon Peres, uh, was, uh, was my former boss as uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. Rabin went, stepped on two, or walked on two tracks, the Syrian and the Palestinian. He actually preferred the Syrian one. And I think maybe one of the more uh, interesting, uh, tantalizing uh, episodes described in, in the book is uh, when he made a deposit to Secretary Christopher, giving him hypothetical conditional willingness to withdraw from the Golan in return for Egyptian-like peace with Syria. And uh, basically, uh, Christopher wasted it. And when Rabin realized that it was wasted, he understood that he had no Syrian option, and he decided to, to accept the Oslo option, not enthusiastically, with, with many, many misgivings. Mm. Uh, it also sounds uh, very much, sorry, I have to say, it also sounds very much like Barak with the Syria negotiations first, the failure of the Syria negotiations, and yeah, then turning to the Palestinian not, uh, Yeah, it's not an accident because there was, a lot, there was a lot of, I mean, Syria today, again, is a, is a different country. If it, if it even is a country. It's, it's a country, it's not a state uh, right now. But at the time, if you compared the 
Palestinian option and the Syrian option, there were many advantages to the to the Syrian option. You had a, an orderly state uh, with a very uh, uh, authoritative leader who could deliver what, what he signed on. And it was a limited conflict. It was a territorial conflict, not an existential one. And compare it to I the... I see. So you're, you're arguing that actually the Syrian negotiations are more attractive in a way to the statesmen of that time, of that phase, because it would have been more feasible to do a deal with that kind of a leader. And once, you made, yeah, once you made the deal with Syria, and, and uh, Syria, Syria was out of the circle of violence, you could then make a much better Palestinian mm-hmm. deal because your cards would have been so much better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to go back to your relationship uh, with Rabin. In the run-up to the assassination at the end of 1995, when you saw all the incitement that was going on in the Israeli streets, did you have a fear for his life? Did you think that an assassination was on the table, even deep, deep down without expressing it? Not not the life, but uh, the whole situation. I remember, uh, I, mean, I was not living here at the time, and I used to visit uh, every few, few weeks. I used to come with Secretary Christopher, and I remember distinctly uh, one weekend, uh, Rabin sti- still needed a meeting with Christopher to, to complete the conversation, and he invited him uh, on a Saturday afternoon to his home in Ramat Aviv. Uh, I lived on the same street, I, uh, so I walked uh, from my, my own home to fi- number five of Ashi Street, which was uh, Rabin's home. And across the street was a bunch of uh, demonstrators with megaphones, shouting, uh, you know, in very rough language, and uh, Rabin Elea will hang your feet up like Mussolini and his mistress. Nobody, there was no police. Nobody, yeah, it was an illicit demonstration. Nobody dealt with them. And it, it felt very awkward That's to true. me. I, uh, I, I really walked away with a, with a very uh, sort of... Uh, ill-boding feeling. Mm. I want to ask you about this because really what it comes down to is the uh, where we started this interview. Did they kill his legacy? And if you think about the turning point of Oslo was to legitimize in a way the idea of a two-state solution, even though it wasn't actually in the accords to say Palestinian state. But I do, you know, I know the public opinion really started to climb in favor of the two-state solution from 1993 throughout the 1990s. And now it's sort of taken as the paradigm. But, of course, the two-state solution is considered to be under grave threat right now. So where do you think things stand in terms of if that is Rabin's legacy, that he legitimized the notion, the paradigm of a two-state solution, does his legacy uh, remain now or is it, is that legacy under yeah. threat? It is under threat and it, it needs to be uh, to be kept and nourished. Uh, Oslo is, is not a popular term now, but uh, you have to remember two things, is uh, that have not been lost. One is that the mutual recognition, the fact that the Palestinians recognized uh, Israel. It was, a, in a way, a mutual recognition between Palestinian nationalism and Zionism. Or, um, that that remains. And that, this is what enables countries like Egypt, Jordan, and, and the, the Sunni states, mentioned five times a day now, uh, to deal with Israel, because their argument is if the Palestinians recognize Israel, why don't so can why we? can't we? Yeah. So that is still on. Second is the fact that there is a Palestinian authority and Israelis don't have to manage uh, Nablus and, uh, uh, and Ramallah and Janine and to deal with the education and with the sewage and other issues. And uh, let's imagine that the Palestinian authority collapses and Israel needs to manage the West Bank. That that is a very negative scenario. So these two elements, the 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 Palestinian, the fact that the Palestinian Authority does manage the lives of most Palestinians in the West Bank, and that the mutual recognition, that is still on. It may be a negative scenario to imagine, but it's not unimaginable. No, <laughs> no. But uh, if it materializes, it will force Israeli society to make very stark choices. Israelis don't tend to make these choices unless uh, severely challenged. Uh, Oslo would not have happened but for the, uh, but for the first intifada. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you one last question before we, we wrap up. What would you say? You said that when you started researching for the book, many things came to light. What would you say was your biggest scoop in inverted commas when it comes to, the, to this book? I mean, you know, a piece of the Rabin yeah. puzzle that we, we did not know about. For me, the childhood, the young Rabin, the the young man whose uh, letters to his father and sister I read and revealed a uh, a very different 
person than uh, the older Rabin that, that we all knew, and the figure of his mother, I think, which mm. uh, had she a comes huge, out as a very strong figure yeah, in the yeah, book. Yeah, huge, had a huge impact on uh, on his life and and persona, and it was a very interesting uh, person in an all right. Actually, I one of the uh, uh, people interviewed said that uh, had she not died at a, at a young age. Uh, she would have been Golda Meir, <laughs> the, the original Golda Meir. Wow. So a very powerful uh, persona and a very interesting one. All right, Professor Itamar Rabinovich, uh, that is where we have to leave it. Uh, thank you very much for coming in today. You're uh, the president of the Israel Institute in D.C. in Tel Aviv, former president of uh, the Tel Aviv University, and as well as uh, a former uh, ambassador to the United States under uh, Itzhak Rabin. And lastly, uh, the author of the new uh, biography of, of Rabin, Itzhak Rabin, soldier, leader, statesman. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Thank you. And also a big thanks to Tammy Goldenberg, our sound engineer, and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. If you like this podcast, and we know you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick. Listen to all of them. Don't forget to visit our new website, telavivreview.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Join us next week again for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye.